I wish we had people jumping who, if they were not participating in fair trade, they were pushing the envelope higher, not pulling it lower. Because what happens then is you have all of these different initiatives who are claiming to be fair or sustainable or in some way farmer friendly or ethical, but not empowering farmers to have truly you know, stronger negotiating power in a contract, not giving them the voice of how the rules of the game are being set up, not providing that kind of budget for organizational development in the mm-hmm. field and in access to really true market um, intelligence and opportunities to meet the market in the market, in trade shows, in the field. And, um, and so what you do is you offer something that sort of looks and sounds like fair trade, but it's cheaper and it's easier to participate in. And so that pulls the, the possibilities down right. instead of pushing them higher. This episode is proudly brought to you by Mapper Forward's workshop, It's Time to Become a Coffee Consultant. Learn how to diversify your revenue streams and create freedom from your day job while saying goodbye to that alarm clock forever by becoming a consultant within the coffee industry or directly to consumers who have shifted towards home brewing and home roasting. Protect your income from challenging times in the coffee value chain by taking this course today. Go to mapperforward.coffee forward slash workshops or click the link in the show notes for details. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Map It Forward Friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and this is episode two of a five-part series. We are talking with Monica, I was about to say Monica Girl, but Monica Furl, <laughs> because that's how Monica told me how to say it. <laughs> she said, it's like a girl, but with an F. Monica Furl <laughs> from Fair Trade International. Monica, welcome back to episode two. I knew I should have said it's like a pearl, but with an F, and that would have been a little bit more, you know, sort of. <laughs> Fantastic fighting. either way, I promise. So, Monica, we're in, in the last series, we were talking about Fair Trade International and what it is in 2024 in coffee. And where I want to start this conversation, where we're talking about the distance between like the language that surrounds fair trade and the action that happens in the market and and what you guys are doing. Where I want to start this is like, can you give us some perspective of like when it comes to the size of the organization, are we talking about like a team of five people that are making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year as an organization? Or are we talking about something that's as a big corporate making many millions of dollars off the certifications, uh, the, the fees that farmers are paying? Where, where does it sit in the sc- scope of things? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I cannot even tell you how many people. And like when we talk about fair trade, we have Fair Trade International, which is a core team. Mm-hmm. And then we have 23 countries now with their they're promoting teams of fair trade and their job is to really, you know, engage with their local industry players, to engage with consumers, to host events, to kind of raise the issues of, you know, sort of trade injustice and and opportunities for fair trade to get on more shelves in their um, in their countries. And I can tell you that some of those teams are like two people. Some of those teams are more like 25 people and all that depends on like the maturity of the initiative in the country, the size of the country, the the sort of the coffee reality volumes and all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, fair trade, the core team, we have also um, small teams, three people are the coffee team um, in the in and well, I should say we're actually two and a half because not all of us are full-time. Okay. We only have one full-time person, which is not me either. Um, and um, But we're support. And then every other product also has a team of a few people. Then there's also the initiatives like, you know, the environment and climate change initiative. There's, you know, human rights due diligence group. There's, you know, living income team. And then there's like the legal team and accounting and separate from us, but kind of linked Maybe at the elbow is, uh, you know, Fair Trade, Flow Cert, which is a certifying body, which has, you know, it's in, its own team. 
I would also say that those, the financial support for that does not come from farmers. Oh. What that comes from is the licensing fees that traders and roasters pay in. Half of the money that the licensing fees of the label on a package actually goes back to farmers. Um, and that's um, a full half of our income goes there. The rest of it gets split between um, the administrative, the promotion, um, events, staff, and all the rest. So okay. it's not us trying to promote well-being of farmers and then skimming off you know, whatever profits they might be. It's quite the contrary, actually. Let, let me dig into that a little bit more because one thing that a lot of people say is fair, fair trade is a scam because producers pay to be a part of this uh, program and fair trade delivers nothing and it just, it's uh, you know, we're talking about like the distance between language and action here. So mm -hmm. I, as a pro coffee producer, I'm paying for my coffee to be certified fair trade right. and I get nothing back for it. And well, so help us understand. You shouldn't, well, if you are paying into a system and getting nothing back from it, then you should probably leave the system. And I would also say, I hear that a lot. You know, it's like, oh, there's been no impact. And I'm like, okay, so I'm sorry. There are now 2 million farmers around the world who are participating in fair trade. Do you think they don't know the difference between profit and loss? You know, they are doing this because they see benefit. And it is true that, you know, we wish every farmer who is engaged in fair trade, whether it's coffee or another product, that they would mm -hmm. sell all of their product to um, fair trade markets. And I would say, in my opinion, that the fact that a handful of coffee cooperatives are selling 100% of their product into fair trade markets, many are selling more than 50%. Some are selling a small fraction and some are not selling into fair trade markets. Mm -hmm. Like um, that is part of everyone's sort of learning and development journey. But I also would say it's a testament to the unwillingness of the industry to embrace shifts in how pricing gets set. And um, tell me more about that. Tell me more well, about what, what you just said. I've heard, you know, like I say, I've been sitting in this chair for only a few years. And, uh, and sure, it's like questioning, you know, is the impact and, you know, well, we can do this differently. But what we've, so a lot of public criticism, but what I've seen, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but, but what I've seen is that people who are, you know, wanting to do something similar to fair trade, but not within the system, um, it's always a cheaper version, right? I don't see people empowering farmers more, guaranteeing better prices, offering more security in the market and saying, look, we don't think fair trade is good enough. We're going to do better. I wish, I wish we had people jumping who, if they were not participating in fair trade, they were pushing the envelope higher not pulling it lower. Because what happens then is you have all of these different initiatives who are claiming to be fair or sustainable or in some way farmer friendly or ethical, but not empowering farmers to have truly you know, stronger negotiating power in a contract, not giving them the voice of how the rules of the game are being set up, not providing that kind of budget for organizational development in the mm -hmm. field and in access to really true market um, intelligence and opportunities to meet the market in the market, in trade shows, in the field. And, um, and so what you do is you offer something that sort of looks and sounds like fair trade, but it's cheaper and it's easier to participate in. And so that pulls the possibilities down right. instead of pushing them higher. And then it sets up this very messy competitive landscape of, well, I can 
make this claim, but I don't really have to put money on the table. And, um, and so that's, that's for most people who are looking for the best coffee at the lowest price, Mm -hmm. that's a very attractive alternative. So yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think every initiative out there, fair trade included, we all need to do better. Mm-hmm. But what I get get a little weary of is hearing this, you know, seeing the energy that goes into like not supporting farmers, but just chest beating and trying to explain to public how my initiative's better, you know, but but not putting money on the table, not putting you know power into balance, not um, eliminating risk in, in, in these transactions for farmers, but it's more a marketing competition um, to, to gain greater share. And like that's, we don't need to grow for growth's sake. We need to grow to fulfill the needs for farmers who desperately need better markets for their products. When you say... I would also... Okay, go ahead. ahead. No, no, please. I would also... Oh, I was just going to say, and in the process of, you know, all this evolutionary shift and growth and change, um, you know, the system has grown incredibly. You know, now the system... In total, it does represent 2 million farmers and they're organized under 1,800 producer organizations and they're certified in 68 different countries selling all kinds of different products, not just coffee, of course. Um, And in the last reporting period, that collective additional social premium was um, paid out $223 million to these different producer organizations. And coffee alone, um, there are some... 825,000 farmers who are organized under 600 fair trade certified producer organizations, and they produce more than 700,000 metric tons of coffee each year and are working a million hectares of land. And they've gotten 96.4 million additional dollars in Mm -hmm. social premiums. And those social premiums, just to clarify, so pushing for better pricing essentially benefits primarily the farmer. Um, those prices get channeled through their cooperatives, but the bulk of that is going to stay in the farmer's hands. But the social premium is going on top of that, 20 cents on top of the final price that's being paid on the contract is going to the organization. And that money then gives the organization some funds to invest in, in the kinds of essential infrastructure that they need, whether it's processing plants or warehouses or um, training training programs to improve quality or compliance or internal governance um, or other kinds of projects that they deem are important and essential to improve the lives of producers. And all of that has to be discussed and vetted and agreed upon in the organization's general assemblies. So, um, so that's sort of trying to keep that balance of money going to the structures that support the farmers, but also trying to increase the money that's actually going into the farmers' hands. So I have two questions there. Uh, first of all, how much of that twenty cents? What percentage of that twenty cents goes back into rebuilding those things or or being invested in those things? So the social all premium, one hundred percent of it. It doesn't get spent on like in wages for employees at at fair trade. No, no. I mean, it might go into hiring people at the producer cooperative. That money goes to the producer cooperative. Then it's up to the assembly and representatives of those organizations to define what is their next strategic step. What do they need to invest in? Sometimes, you know, COVID, a lot of that money went to food baskets, you know, or to emergency health. Sometimes when the market is really crazy, really low, or you know, these regional fluctuations that don't make sense with the market, money laundering, um, currency variations, 
all kinds of things that happen in, in, in different countries that throw the local price of coffee mm -hmm. off kilter with even the crazy commodities so, yeah. price fluctuations. So sometimes that money will go in to compensate to make sure farmers that the co-op can compete with the local middlemen. Um, but mostly that money is going into things that, you know, more long-term stable investments, um, some learning infrastructure, sometimes staff, um, materials. And, um, but that is each cooperative's uh, job mm -hmm. to define, document, and implement the investment of that premium money. And, and within the standards now, there is also kind of an earmark of um, it's five cents on the 20 that should go towards um, productivity and quality improvement. And that also, I believe, was sort of a negotiation with the producer networks, because sometimes the farmers themselves say, no, I just want it all going into my into my payment or I want it all right. going into a social program. But the co-op itself also needs to look out for its its own stability. So they need farmers to have better yields. They need farmers mm -hmm. to know how to maintain and improve their quality. And that's kind of a, a long-term investment for the good of all, mm -hmm. but um, it was the way to kind of protect some of those funds for the sort of like basic, obvious, constant needs. And my second question was, when you say that the producer assemblies are part of determining what gets done with that uh, that premium, who makes up those producer uh, assemblies? Uh, so, um, are they fair trade employees? Uh, are they? No, those are those producers. Okay, those fantastic. are producers. So, when I say like every one of these questions, I could always answer. It depends. Yeah, right. <laughs> because it does depend. <laughs> yeah. You know, some cooperatives are very small. Yeah. And the assembly is everybody. They all come together. Right. Um, I've worked with other cooperatives where, you know, the membership is so dispersed. Like, you know, remember one where, like, some of the farmers are living a three-day walk wow. from distance from the central warehouse. So, like, in you know, so they would have more, like, you know, delegates coming in. But the delegates from those different remote regions need to be bringing the voice of those farmers um, so, you know, it can vary that way, but these are farmer representatives within farmer organizations deciding how these premiums are going to be um, utilized. And when those organizations get a flow served audit coming through, one of the things that they are going to be looking at is where are your notes of your last General Assembly? What did you say you were going to do? What did you do? Where's the proof? And then they get sort of a progress score on that of fully compliant, partially compliant, not compliant at all. And that's where um, you know, some red flags or yellow flags could be thrown up if an organization is not actually following what was declared as the, the priorities of their membership. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to ask next is like a lot of people – you know, have some issues around, you know, fair trade is corrupt. Um, people who are engaging in fair trade are corrupt. Uh, where does the, how does the auditing work? Is there any auditing? Um, and, and I think this is a good time for us to have a bit of a conversation around those kinds of accusations that people have. Right. Auditing around with the farmer organizations. Yeah. And with fair yeah. trade international, I guess. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Fair Trade International. Um, so yes, the farmer groups are, are um, audited on a regular basis by um, uh, by FlowCert. Okay. So and FlowCert goes in. You know, inspectors will go in and with the standards and looking at you know um, inclusion. You know, labor res you know, respect for labor rights. Um, you know, the environmental criteria the democratic decision-making parts, the mm -hmm. financials. I mean, there is a long, long list of, uh, I read through again, there was like 77 pages of the general standards, another 34 pages on the coffee standard. 
There's a separate standard for traders. And, you know, and everyone has a list. Some of the criteria are like um, absolutes, like must fulfill, must fulfill. And then there are a whole series of criteria that are developmental. So you need to show progress towards, for example, transition towards, you know, best possible agricultural practices or, you know, these types of things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that it makes for it's quite a a complex process. Um, But for fair trade itself, um, it has, you know, there is a very strict audit every year it's being audited and you know to get things approved through finance everything goes through if we want to hire a subcontractor or on some project or another or launching something things get passed to the legal department then it gets passed to the financial department everyone needs to check off the um you know the the unit heads need to be informed that's whose signature i guess it's not like you know people walk working in their dark corners where it's like, oh, I want to do this and I want to do that. And, you know, right. it's like there is a whole process of, you know, we were starting now our planning for next year, our priorities, how does that stack up against everyone else's priorities, looking at our global budget, looking at potential external funding, um, looking then justifying, like, why are we asking for money for this, this and this and showing that, you know, the benefits, expected benefits and impact for um, growth in sales for farmers' product. Okay. There or, is... you know, of course, it's not just that. Also, like, awareness and, and outreach and some of the other things that we do. I'm clearly starting to get the impression, or I'm getting starting to get the impression that clearly this is a very uh, intricate web of, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not p- – people seem to think that this is the way that fair trade works. Uh, you apply for a certification. You mm. get the right to be a part of that certification. You pay the fee, and then it's a free for all for everybody. And that allows predators to come in and do some dodgy shit. And we're going to talk about that not in the next episode, but mm-hmm. the one after it. But mm-hmm. it seems to be that once somebody becomes a part of fair trade, now all of a sudden, that's when all this corruption and other a whole bunch of other things start happening. And I'm starting to get the impression that it's a lot more involved than what many of us think it is. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. I mean, first of all, you, in order, it is a complex process to become yeah. organic certified. And I've also said this, you know, I'll say it now again. My personal approach to certifications, I've said this in my former job as well, and you know, certification is a tool. Mm-hmm. And choose that tool when it will help unlock an issue for you, right? So, and it's, it's not a simple process. Certifications by their virtue and certificating bodies also get audited and inspected and have to, you know, they have a bunch of criteria that they need to be able to comply with mm-hmm. in order for their certification to be considered legitimate. So like there's this whole chain of oversight that kind of drives you into certain kind of operating directions. Right. But for a pharma organization to become organic, uh, Fair trade certified, then um, you know, they need to really have systems in place, and so it pushes them. And so, if if you just brought a bunch of people together last week and you want to sell your coffee together, you are probably you are definitely not ready for certification. Nor will that serve you, right? Um, right. You you need to be capable of exporting. In fact because there are so many more groups that want to become organic certified than we see market, one of the points on a checklist is, will you have market for this? Because we don't want people spending money and time and effort on getting certified when they don't have the capacity to put themselves into the market. Like we want people to come together, form really solid, functional, um, productive cooperatives and know that they can get the right kind of coffee on a boat that can get into these premium markets that they can negotiate 
pay high prices for their efforts and be successful and that they can expand upon that. And that's so the certification. Um, and it's not to say that you can't put your coffee out somewhere and uh, get a great price for it. But the the what fair trade was sort of betting on when it launched is that we can bring these coffees to a mass market back when, you know, the coffees you saw on the mass market shelves were these big tins, you know, right. for whatever, you know, five bucks a, ta- a, pa- a kilo or something, you know, but like we can put other coffees on those shelves, but we need that coffee to speak to people. We need that coffee to be able to say, hey, you know, I am not like that other guy that I come from small scale farmers that we are every purchase is also promoting local development is promoting you know autonomy is promoting a, you know self esteem and, and and dignity in in coffee farmers communities and this label is your sort of your your window Hallmark. right yeah it's it's and it's it's the label is just to get your attention and then you know and and I honestly would like to see much much more information on the package or you know, a lot of companies now also they're doing you know, QR codes so you can go in, you can take a look further in because there's also, as we know, <laughs> every market research team will tell you there's a two second window of to get someone's attention before exactly. you know they pick this product versus the other. So again, it's like this tug of war be- between wanting to give more information. And I always am criticized of wanting to go overboard with too much detail, <laughs> but I but feel like the consumer is so starting to want it. The consumer yeah. cares now more than any other time. The consumer wants to know that if you're saying that you're participating in fair trade, they want to understand what that means exactly. They mm-hmm. don't want to participate in dysfunctional purchases. They don't. Yeah. They they they're more conscious than they've ever been. Yeah. So it's. I think it is important. I think it's a. It, yeah. We're we're entering a time when you need to tell the story behind. The, the, sure. the custodians of this coffee. Yeah. Yes. And um, and it's also, it's so important and it's also so challenging. I mm. promise you, like I have had a lifetime in this and I also have a lifetime link to journalism and yeah. this challenge of having people understand what a person's life is like when they're struggling mm. day yeah. in, day out, just to keep food on the table when they've never experienced that like their drama is because they weren't able to get like the ne- their newest whatever apple iphone you know right the first week of launch you know it's just like we're talking about universes that are so far apart um maybe can i give you a little glimpse of like what i've yes. seen some shifts yeah so like when i lived in shoppers this was like in the mid 90s and i um So what the difference between a farmer's experience selling coffee then versus what many farmers are experiencing now. And so I was working with this young, a new cooperative. They were actually the first Zapatista cooperative in Chiapas. And I had supported them to export their first container load of coffee. And with the second grade coffee, we were trying to sell to a local middleman. So the segundos. And so I remember we walk into this warehouse and it's dimly lit and we've got our coffee. We negotiate our price and we're delivering. And then like the the buyer gives Lucio, the manager, a check. And our first instinct is to run to the bank just to make sure there's actually funds that it's in the account. Clear. Right. Yeah, exactly. But then our second instinct is to stop at the door and and make sure there's no one with a gun you know, to take the check back away because like that, wow, that was like the reality. And, you know, and farmers, these are like farmers in the highlands of Chiapas and they're like sons and daughters of second and third generation coffee farmers who have just been abused, like abused constantly. So like those are the instincts you must develop. Um, So a few years later with this same group, you know, that first container load had turned into a stable relationship with a fair trade buyer. And we'd facilitated a group of roasters to come and visit this group. And, uh, and so, you know, eight roasters, we had, you know, two dozen 
representatives and the co-op was explaining to the roasters some of their challenges. This is also still a very turbulent time in mm -hmm. Chiapas and the many things that they were confronting. And then the roasters were explaining kind of how their coffee had been received, how it was being roasted, what consumers had to say about it. And like for both sides, it was like, wow, this is amazing. Well, so the conversation goes long into the, the evening. We end up sleeping in their office on oh, um, wooden pallets. And in the morning, um, same Lucio, who's no longer the president of their board, but still very engaged with the co-op. He pulls me aside as everyone's saying goodbye. And like, this is like a pretty tough guy. And he's all teary eyed. And he yeah. tells me, I never thought in my lifetime that I would give my hand in friendship to a person who purchased my coffee. And oh my it was God. just chilling to like, wow. I mean, just the shift in, and this is something I think people do not understand who have never had like a hopeful pathway laid out for them that just knowing that there's some people out there in your business that you can trust is huge. It's especially, massive. It's massive, especially when you've never had that before. So these are the kinds of shifts that we try to make. And some of it might look so transactional, but mm -hmm. um, the farmers also need the transactions. They yeah. want to sell their coffee. That's what they want. <laughs> so, um, but we want to do this in a dignified way where mm -hmm. we can come to a table and, and talk about people's needs. And yeah, and sometimes adjust what you thought you were going to be paying for coffee because it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And also, like, these are your suppliers. And uh, I remember, you know, I used to be a green buyer and going to these industry events and and uh, at a time when, oh, my God, all the importers, they're like talking about contract defaults, defaults. And I'm like, I literally had whispered to someone next to me, like, what's a default? You know, right. because like I worked for a group where we had strong relationships and the last Nobody thing I wanted to do was to contract in a way that's going to put my partner out of business. You yeah. know, so we had conversations. Oh, something happened. Okay, you got hit with leaf rust. Oh, you, you know, like your your crops delayed because of, you know, rains or no rains or whatever it was. And um, and we worked together. And I will tell you, it was the most efficient, most cost effective risk management I could have come up with because this got delivered. Our communication was great. What we saw was farmers bending over backwards to deliver our coffee mm. when we want it, how we want it. And when there was a problem, we worked it out, right? Yeah. And just, sorry, just so the people who are listening, uh, who are going, what is a default? A default is when somebody <laughs> decides that they can't fulfill the contract, they're terminating the contract, or they're just backing out of it. And this often happens when you see that the price has been very low and people have committed to uh, selling their coffee at this contracted price, let's say it's $1.75, which is like the, the market average. And then the market does what it's doing now, which is it's at two, you know, bouncing between 230 and 250. And coffee producers have the option to turn around and say, well, you know what? Like the sea market's doing something really great that could benefit me. So maybe I just default on this contract that I've currently got. Say yeah. I don't have any coffee. And then I find somebody yeah. else who will buy it at two fifty. Go ahead. But I would also say sometimes those cops don't have that coffee. Yeah, 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 yes. Yeah. It's like, what do you mean you're gonna offer me? It's a when I heard people talking about defaults. My first question is, wow, what was wrong with your contract? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like yeah. why? Yeah. Why wouldn't a farmer sell like they don't eat coffee? Like they sell coffee. What they want to do is sell all their coffee. Mm -hmm. You know, and so. This is also, you know, we when we step into history, looking at the very last chapter, mm -hmm. you know, but not looking at, okay, we have, first of all, this insane price setting mechanism that goes all over the place. And like what we're seeing these last it's five or six months is like wild, wild, unbelievable, unbelievable. Like it's completely dysfunctional for everybody. 
mm-hmm. but particularly for a farmer organization. So, you know, the fact that they're being asked to commit to a price so far in advance, first of all, it's like, who would do that? Mm-hmm. Like, if you do that, how do they force you to do that? And then to see that, I mean, because if the price then went up, like the buyers are, it's like the, what they're looking at is the additional profit they can make. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're going to burn a relationship in the process, which is short sighted. And a farmer for for a farmer to be able to convince people to bring coffee in below the cost of what a local middleman could sell would buy for, you know, that's also like what a terrible like it, it's like a double discriminatory because you know it's like first of all you're not valuing the farmer's efforts but then also you're putting that co-op in the worst light possible so Mm -hmm. it's like a destructive blow to the co-op oh you can't even keep up with the coyote price so it's like but then if the co-op doesn't deliver then they also face these really stiff fines for non-compliance and i've heard of like really expensive fines for people so it's like you set a loss you risk getting a fine. It, it's like this, this labyrinth that you never seem to be able to get yourself out of, mm-hmm. of like just sort of like dead ends okay. <laughs> at every turn. So, so, so we are doing a terrible job of keeping at our time, <laughs> folks. And, and let me tell you, we are being very restrained. So we're going to do try and do much better um, in the rest of this series of trying to keep it around the 20 minutes. We apologize, but our conversa- I hope you've been enjoying the conversation so far. Join us in the next episode uh, where we're talking about this idea of like fair trade being a savior. Uh, and is it here to save anyone? Who is it here to help? Who isn't it here to help? Uh, and we're going to deep dive into that. So join us for the next episode. Peace, love, and peanut butter. Have an amazing rest of your day. I really hope you enjoyed this episode, friends. Please don't forget to show us some love by subscribing, liking, commenting, and most of all, sharing this podcast with your friends. Check the show notes for links, including our sponsors and our Patreon, and stay tuned for more great conversations on the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward.